Joint Select Board and Planning Board meeting for the Town of Deerfield on July 11th, 2022, and the time is 5.30 p.m. This is a remote Zoom meeting. Meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the Governor Baker's June 16th, 2021 Act, extending certain provisions of COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, including the extension of the remote participation provisions of his March 20, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20. Um, remote meeting connections are listed on our agenda. There is a toll-free number of 833-548-0276. The meeting ID is 911-604. 1580. The passcode, should you need it, is 570012. On that agenda that you'll find on the Town of Deerfield website in the calendar on the bottom right, there's a Zoom link where you can attend there. Um, so, meeting attendees should mute their phones. If you're on a landline, that is star six, unless asking questions or commenting. All attendees should wait to speak until other participants are finished. Um, and I will wait for the planning board to open their meeting and then we'll uh, I can read the language for the executive session. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and I will call to order the meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board on July 11, 2022 at 530 p.m. Uh, with the same yes. <laughs> preamble as uh, Trevor uh, just went through and I will um, go through our roll call. Uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason present. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine present. And Mary Cloutier. And Mary Cloutier present. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester present. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba present. Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson present. And Emily Wolfcool present. Thank you. Great. Um, so with the meetings called to order, pursuant to General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, and subject to the Chair's declaration and roll call votes, the Select Board and Planning Board may meet in executive session, discuss strategies with respect to litigation, uh, Rathburn v. Deerfield Select Board et al., Rathburn v. Deerfield Planning Board et al., if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the town. Um, this chair so declares, does the planning board chair declare as well? Oh, yes. And I do okay. have a question actually okay. about minutes during executive session. <laughs> yes. Yep, we'll we'll take a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure we have some minutes. Yep. Um, I mean, so, do we both take minutes? Yes, for each board, you should probably yes take minutes. Yep. We can we can discuss in um, executive session how we should take minutes. Um, yeah. Make that motion, Carolyn. A second for uh, Deerfield Select Board. No, all those in, oh, thank you, Tim. And then all those in favor. Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Nessa, aye. Great. And um, we'll also invite in um, Adam Costa, uh, our town attorney, and uh, James Martin, um, our special attorney for the select board, and Casey Warren, our town administrator. Uh, do you need a motion from the planning board? Or... Yes, we do. Yep, we need a motion from the planning board and a roll call vote to enter executive session. Same motion. Annalee, you have to you have to use the same language that the select board used. It's on it's on the um, agenda. Okie dokie here. Just one moment, please. I've got my agenda right here almost. Um, sorry. <clears throat> All right. Um, I pursuant to GL chapter 30A, section 21A3, and subject to the chair's declarations and roll call votes, the planning board is meeting in, would may meet in executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, Rathbone versus Deerfield Select Board et al., and Rathbone versus Deerfield Planning Board et al. If an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the litigation position of the town. So may I have a, um, motion pursuant to that statement. Sure. Um, I move that we um, 
have that executive session for okay. the planning board. Was Andrew, Andrew Liebson and a second. Rachel uh, Blaine, second. And um, I'll have a roll call vote. Denise Mason, or any discussion? No discussion. Denise Mason? Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine? Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary Cloutier? And Mary Cloutier, yes. Kathy Sylvester? Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittroba? Kathy Wittroba, yes. Andrea Liebson? Andrea Liebson, yes. And Lee Wolf, yes. And if I could just suggest before we depart for executive session that both chairs announce that you will adjourn from executive session and not return to open session. That's correct. Yes, we will. Uh, the select board will adjourn from executive session and will not return to um, open session. And same for the planning board. The planning board will exert. Uh, uh, adjourn from executive session and then we will open our regular meeting with planning board. Thank you. Thank you. After a brief break. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Case you give a room for us. All right. So I will call to order the meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board on Monday, July 11th, 2022, um, with a reminder of our meeting guidelines to speak one at a time, following our Deerfield Code of Conduct to be respectful, considerate, and courteous, also concise, non-repetitive, recognized by the chair, and acknowledging the time limits of our vice chair. <laughs> uh, board members in attendance, uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason here. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine here. And Mary Cloutier. Oh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Almost She's coming. Her way. Uh, Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester here. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba here. Andrew Liebson. Andrew Liebson here. And Emily Wolfkull here. So maybe we'll just continue and we'll make note of Mary when she joins. Um, and um, at this point, I'll pass the um, agenda on to Rachel, who has quite a few minutes for us to approve. Hey, everybody. So Happy reading. And actually, as we all went through, well, as we all went through our, um, our roll call, Ken, you saw us all. We'll see you in a minute. But Consider yourself introduced. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Yes, uh, Rachel. So uh, we have before us so much excellent reading. Um, we have first the um, opening, actually, of the it's four four, uh, the fourth of April. It was the beginning of the we opened the public hearing. Um, so I present those to you for approval. I move that we approve the minutes of four of April 4th, 2022. I second that, Denise Mason. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> any any comments, any corrections? Right. Okay. No, so and, again, well, for all of these, we do need the roll call vote. Yes, yeah, yeah. We'll just go quickly. Denise. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary, has she joined it? Not yet. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba, yes. Andrew Leibson. Andrew Leibson, yes. And Lee Wolfkull, yes. So consider those approved. And actually, I think that Annalie might not have been there for that one. So it doesn't, I think. Anyway, because you know, when you're not, there's one that she wasn't there for. And I think that was no, it. No, but I, my understanding is that um, we don't have to have attended the minutes in order to vote on the minutes. We don't have to have attended the meeting in order to vote. Oh, well, you have to have reviewed it. Oh, yes. We want to review them. Well, we want to. No, you have, I think you have to. Uh, uh, well, can you can no. this, but I think we review them, the minutes. We don't need to actually listen to the whole oh. recording. I don't believe, Ken, you want to opine? <laughs> um, let's see. I don't think the approval of minutes, I, I don't think I've, I've ever interacted with um, uh, an approval of minutes where someone who didn't attend the meeting, they, they chose to abstain. Um, I'm not, I, I've never had a meeting where someone that wasn't present didn't, uh, that someone that wasn't present voted, um, but that doesn't say, I think it could be, in it. 
taken as, as an administrative like task um, because it is administration of your planning board role. Um, I've seen it done mostly where that person would abstain. However, I don't know if there yeah. is a legality um, in regards to that. Yeah. Say. I think it makes, uh, it's, it's a log logical thing. So I can abstain. I'll change my vote there. No, no, you were there. I was there. Who wasn't there? And Anne Mary. That's the only one too. That's, I think that's the only one. Everybody else was at everything. So this is uh, just moot, but I'm just saying, and is okay. Anne Mary even on yet? I don't know. Yeah, okay. No, not yet, oh. I believe. So there you go. So she's abstaining anyway. Okay. So then I'm going to present um, <clears throat> the next minutes, which are uh, five and nine, uh, the 9th of May. This is our big month. Um, and that, interestingly, is not a public hearing meeting. That was the ANR. So anyway, I present them for your review and approval. No, well, it looks like there was a public hearing on the- It was, uh, but not the continuation of the <laughs> municipal park, but rather of the um, long driveway. Right. You're right. It wasn't an ANR. It was a public hearing. And Sorry, a, but it was a, different a public hearing. A motion to accept the minutes of 5-9. I make a motion to accept the minutes of 5 9. Kathy Sylvester. Second? Uh, Andrea, second. <coughs> Thank you. Any discussion? Corrections, anybody? Annalie did a good oh. bet. <laughs> All right. Uh, Denise will call the question. Denise Mason? Denise Mason, yes. Rachel? Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary, are you here yet? Not yet. Uh, Kathy Sylvester? Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wotroba. Kathy Wotroba, yes. Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson, yes. Emily Wolf Cool, yes. All right, moving right along, 519. Well, this is this is the continuation of the public hearing. Um, this when we had the peer review. Um, so I present these for your review and approval. May we have a motion? I make a motion that we approved. The minutes, 519, is it? Yeah. Kathy Sylvester and uh, second that, Denise Mason. Thank you, Denise. Mm -hmm. uh, any discussion? All right. Uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary Cloutier, not yet. Uh, Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wotroba. Kathy Wotroba, yes. Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson, yes. Emily Wolf Yes. Okay. We only have two more. 525. Okay. Moving right along. So the next one was the little rump, you know, tiny meeting that we, where we, we moved with our decision. That is a 525. Mm -hmm. And I present this for your review and approval. Thank you. A motion, please. I move to approve the meeting minutes of 525 22. And that was Andrea. Second. Yes. Okay, second, Kathy yeah. Sylvester. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> I need discussion. All right, uh, call the question. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary Cloutier, not yet. Uh, Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. <coughs> Sorry. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba, yes. Andrew Liebson. Andrea Liebson, yes. And Emily Wolf Cool, yes. And the last ones, uh, just last month. So the last one I wasn't at this when you talked about me, so that's okay. And uh, <laughs> and but I did listen very carefully. So um, these are my so they might you know require the most the best review. Um, very interesting. You guys are so smart and well spoken. Just saying. So All and right. there was a lot of discussion about the um, fees and regulations. So. Just right. as a review. So, so yes. I actually um, had one correction. Can we? Which, we'll put it before, and then we'll call for sure. that. Thank yes. you. Um, can we have a motion, please? I move that we uh, um, accept the minutes from June sixth, twenty twenty two. Andrea, yeah. and thank you. Andrea. Second, Denise. Thank you, Denise. And discussion, especially Andrea's first in line. Um, we, during the discussion of the fees and schedule, uh, we made the comment that we were going to have public hearing on July 11th. 
Subsequently, um, we decided not to do that because there was so much to discuss. So that should, the, the date of should. July 11th for a public hearing should be changed to, um, will take place um, in, at, a, at a meeting to be determined. So did we decide that at that meeting? Yes. yes. Have we decided it subsequently? Okay. Great. Right. We decided not to not to hold it on July 11th subsequently. At, at that meeting? Yes. Okay. So it was just later in the meeting. I'm trying to figure out. I, thought, I remember seeing that we actually mentioned here that it would be at the August meeting, but I don't see that. I know. Right My remembrance is that it said that July 11th, and um, then I think we determined oh, we here. still had questions. Did you find it? Yeah, right above where it says number six, the second sentence above that um, is that we will move our public hearing to our August meeting, not the July meeting. Okay. So I don't know if that's adequate. Do you want me to, I can change that though, Andrea, just make it more definitive. I'll well, I'm actually concerned. We, we, we'll be discussing it again tonight. And so I want to, uh, I don't know that we will in fact be ready to do that on even in August. Well, we can discuss August. that. We can discuss right. that tonight. So, I, so I would prefer that it's in, in, at a subsequent meeting. A public hearing will be held. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, any other discussion? All right. Uh, voting. Denise Mason. Denise Mason. Yes. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine. Oh, as amended. Yeah. Yeah. As amended. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I not yet. Uh, Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba, yes. Andrew Liebson. Andrew Liebson, yes. And Emily Wolfgel, yes. And thank you very much, Rachel, for your uh, <laughs> diligent yeah. work here. All right, um, new business. And we have um, our uh, planner, Ken Comia. Call me or Comia? Ken? Comia. Comia, got it. We got to get this right, says Annalie Wolfkohl, right? <laughs> uh, who from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And uh, just to introduce himself, talk a little bit about what he may be doing with us. And then also I can fill in a little bit from the FERCOG standpoint. So, Ken? Yes, uh, good evening, board. Um, as Annalie um, briefly introduced, my name is Ken Comia. I'm a uh, Deputy Director of Land Use and Environment at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. I've been there now for three and a half years. Um, a lot of my work is working with municipalities, um, particularly planning boards is, is one, one section of my work, um, doing zoning bylaws, development review, um, talking about efficiencies, how to make some of the processes more efficient, um, particularly with applications and um, documentation of applications and ensuring that if you have an expiration date or a special permit that might be expiring, ensuring that you're informing that um, applicant that that date is coming, um, as well as doing some administrative work, building capacity as I can. Um, and so with that, I, I do bring to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and uh, a lot of my work with the four other communities where I'm currently providing this similar service, Blanford, Granby, Hadley, and Pelham. Um, but I, I came to the Pioneer Valley with three and a half, or with uh, working um, as a municipal planner, um, both in Massachusetts as a town planner and conservation agent for the town of Southbridge, um, that's in South Worcester County. And um, prior to that working in Central Florida, as a, a city planner and a county planner, doing similar development review, ensuring the, the comprehensive plan and those types of zoning amendments um, and working through uh, regulatory documents. So a lot of my work is regulatory based in what you have written. Um, and so um, with that said, um, you know, uh, with Annalie coming to the PVPC as well as Jan, Janet, uh, no, not Janet, Casey and Jen, um, you know, asking for the services that we're providing at PVPC. Um, it was uh, exciting to, to step out of the, the region, get to learn about, uh, quickly learn 
um, and will continue to learn a little bit more about um, the town um, and provide um, guidance as I can. Um, currently, and I know Annalie can fill in the blanks with regards to some of the things that you know we may be doing over the next couple of months, um, looking particularly at um, some specific items, uh, drafting decisions um, for the board, um, assisting with the review of development applications, providing that planning component. Um, you may have a process that you're currently employing and I'm happy to just guide you along that process, um, providing any other technical assistance as I can to the town, to the board, um, and then attending um, these meetings. Um, I know that um, uh, FERCOG, you know, may, um, they currently don't have a land use planner, so I, that, that's why you're, you're seeking this particular assistance, but um, they are apt to do um, any sort of master planning, comprehensive planning, mm -hmm. planning document work, um, and, and should you need that, you know, I'm sure that they could fulfill that for you. Um, but I'm happy to engage however you'd like me to, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll fill in just a little bit. Um, as we know from some of our previous discussions and Ken alluded to, um, within Franklin County, our sort of planning assistance of first reckoning is is for cog but when for cog is not available then we're able to uh, go outside of our geographic area and and that's how we're able to sort of um, officially be able to uh, get ken's assistance through pioneer valley um, i have subsequently also had some conversations with uh, um cog and um, apparently, although they are short staff, they are hiring some. And so if we, as if it's almost like if we as the planning board think of Ken as being able to assist us basically with site plan review, special permit, A&R also Ken, and stormwater too? To an extent, um, obviously stormwater, I am not an engineer, so I can't review, you know, calculations. If you usually do peer review, that's what I would advise. Okay, um, so um, sort of starting from the application process, working some with Jen as they have the pre-submission submission meetings, um, coming to the public hearing time, helping us with drafting conditions and ultimately drafting the, the decision and then, um, Right, you know, writing up the the decision. So Ken would be involved more with that. Um, Jennifer. Um, so I just heard, and I wasn't aware of this before. Just so I'm clear, so Ken would come to the pre-submittal meetings. Uh, potentially, if they're needed. You know, I mean, we we can um, evaluate that as as um, applications come through. Um, we'll certainly want to have some pre-housekeeping meetings before we get started. We'll see how that works. But, you know, I think we're trying to be loose and as it's, a, it's an as needed basis. Um, he certainly would be available for attending the, the public hearings, which I think will be helpful for helping to write up the conditions and then ultimately writing the decision. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure so because you know, if I get an application or application comes in and, you know, Bob talks to me whether then I loop Ken in before it comes back to the board and then back to our office. Um, well, let's chat about that. I mean, if we don't, if it feels like we don't need, if it feels fairly straightforward, I would imagine not. But if it looks like it's going to be something that's of relative complexity, it might make sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Andrea. Um, in order to engage with Ken, would we go through you, Annalie, or would we be contacting him directly? I'm thinking about the fee schedule, et cetera, that document I've been working on and wondering if um, um, if he had started earlier, would he be one of the people that we would have shown it to early 
uh, so that he could make comments. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to be feeling this out, but I think probably either we'll be deciding it at the time when we're making decisions at the planning board meetings, or else you can talk with me about, about okay. it. I mean, Ken and I might be talking on a monthly basis at least and seeing what makes sense. Does that make sense, Ken? Yeah. Especially that. since Andrea um, and everyone, uh, there's again this um, wanting to be very clear for both P Pioneer Valley Planning Commission as well as for COG is that we're very clear about where who should be doing what because it may be that in fact for COG would be the ones to look at the these schedule. Okay. Thank you. That's a good question, though. All right. Um. So. Um. Ken, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Right now, um, right this very moment, we don't have any, well, we might have some pending <laughs> site plan review, um, but there's nothing um, happening right this very moment. So um, we'll kind of uh, keep you in, in the loop. And um, we're really glad to be, very glad to uh, be moving forward with this. So, Thanks a bunch. Thank you. And again, um, you know, Anna Lee and um, Lord, I am looking forward to, to getting to work with the board on the various things that you may have before you. Um, I'm happy um, if it makes sense, Anna Lee, to look at the fee schedule. That was something that I actually just completed last year with another community. We were going through that process. Um, so if, you know, if you determine that that makes sense, I can take a look at that. But I'm well, happy to engage yeah, however you like, and um, I look forward to our next conversation whenever that is. Nice. Good. Um, thank you. That's great. And I'll kind of put a note about the fee schedule there, and we'll figure that one out. I'm sure it will all become clear as we work with FERCOG, but right now it does feel a little bit awkward, <laughs> but we'll manage it. All right. Cool. Thank you. Um, very much. Um, and um, otherwise, also, too, um, I did sort of send around this piece about questioning is whether or not we can keep track of our hours. And I think I was a little bit, um, um, maybe a little bit more comprehensive there than what might be warranted. Rachel um, sent back a, a really good summary saying, thinking that, you know, the intention of logging our hours could potentially be to, so that a few, this is very good. So a future board member would know what to expect. That's nice. <laughs> um, so that we understand how much time is being devoted to the different projects. I might talk about that in a minute. Um, and also, so the townspeople are supposed to know how much volunteer labor goes into small town governance. I think tied into that is that very definitely that we are collecting data um, for lobbying for a full-time planner next spring. Um, as I was certainly working a little bit with this this week, I realized, um, yeah, you know, I mean, here I've got three or four different columns of different categories, and maybe it would be really nice to have those categories, but I was all over the place. I, I wasn't able to say, am I working on meeting prep? Am I doing email? Am I doing projects? I think probably just, you know, making hash marks and keeping track of of hours. Um, I don't know if anyone else had any other ideas about it. I mean, it may feel like, busy work, but I think uh, next spring it could be kind of important. Any other thoughts? Everybody well, I think that one of the things that tricky is, um, you know, for instance, here's Denise, she's got her fingers in so many pots and they're not unrelated to our work together in the planning board. So I, th I think that's complicated and it's worth, I, I think it's worth logging in because from Denise's point of view, nothing that she's doing with CCI is not related to planning board. I mean, you know, but obviously the CIPC, this, you know, CPC, uh, those, you know, those ones where we are, um, we have a delegate, we have a representative on those boards. That's obviously, that should be in this, not from the point of view of lobbying for a planner, but to let people know when they're joining that there are other things that will draw on their time, not just showing up for a meeting once a month. Right. I mean, I've kind of put it in the category of if I weren't on the planning board, would I be doing this particular task? And, um, and that's what I would log down. So I don't know, Denise, this is a good sort of, you know, there are blurred areas, but 
and we we certainly want it to be as accurate as possible, but there are some times when it's more specifically towards one board than another. Well, yes, Denise. Well, I mean, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, if you're just gathering data for the planning board, then it would just really be, you know, how many planning board meetings do we attend, and you know, what are you know, what uh, roles do you have? For instance, Annalie, you spend more time since you're the chair. I don't spend quite as much time, even though I'm a vice chair, although I do spend more time with the CCI. Rachel taking minutes. Um... <laughs> and the so, thing is like in May we had, th the thing is in May we had three meetings and we meet always for two hours. Yes. So just for all of us, that's six hours. Mm -hmm. like six vital hours. And that doesn't include, you know, reading the materials in advance, making sure that we're, you know, available. And I'm, I was thinking about this, like Kathy walking her dog and having to stop with everybody to, to chat about the things. And that, that doesn't even count really. That's just like, <laughs> but I, I think that um, those meetings, we don't just meet once a month. Mm -hmm. well, this is supposed to be our fallow time. Yeah. <laughs> we also have a post uh, annual town meeting. Kathy. We we also have a at times a really large volume of of uh, information to read and analyze and you know really put into some cognitive sense and, and much of it for many of us is is new. So we really have to spend meaningful time in that engagement of of reading and analysis too which I, I happen to really like, but it is time that we use. And yes, sure. multiple conversations, walking my dog is that goes on and on, but it, it's all, it's all good. But there, there is definitely some time behind that. Right, right, right. Um, well, I, I think the main thing is that we can keep track of it on a monthly basis. So some, so that's kind of like, okay, in general, so many hours a month per person or the planning board has done such and such. And, and then maybe um, I'll ask for when things can be, you know, if you can send me your send me your numbers and I don't, you know, as you'll notice, I mean, we're not taking, we're not taking tabs on this as to who's done how much, you know, one meeting. We're, we're not getting pay raises based on hours spent. Yeah, right, right, right. You're just getting your, yeah, right. I yeah. think it's interesting to see though, like, the data as it relates to time and time that we spend engaging with our planning board responsibilities and time of year. So when are high volumes, yes. are those peak volumes and um, how do we prepare for that? And what can we do in those times when that volume is low? Where can we sort of supplement other things to, to balance it off a little bit? Right. All right. It, well, does it feel okay to, you know, just try to, you know, keep it on your desk and just make little hash marks and once a month you can send it in to me and we'll just start keeping track of it. And then maybe next year we can move Ken away from PBPC and have you full time. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Okay. Any other, anything else on that? Okay. Um, so old is this reorganization. Um, I've been trying to talk with everyone sort of on a one on one basis and um, was able to talk some with Rachel and we in fact at our last meeting did not um, have our reelection for planning clerk because Rachel was not able to be there and we wanted to make sure she could speak speak for herself. So Rachel we had a good conversation on on that but I'll let you. Speak. Yeah, so I, I, I wanted to thank Anne Mary she's not here but she stuck up. It's just, I was, you know, and it's embarrassing. What's that? It's hard. She's, she's trying to get on for some reason. She's having difficulty. With that. I'm here. My, my video is not working. Oh, well, there you are. She's iPhone. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you. And Mary, you're my champion. I really appreciate it because I felt very, you know, I, I, there I was listening to meetings, the minutes, and I just feeling terrible, like I'm taking the notes and it just, it takes a lot of time as Anne Mary pointed out. And when it's May, which is, you know, September and May are my busiest months and December is short behind, but I, I'm just, I was swamped, absolutely swamped. And so I, I felt badly and it was 
important kind of critical notes. And then I also listened to your discussion about the, you know, level of detail and the idea that it, somebody who reads the notes should understand what was being discussed. Um, and I just, I struggle with that a bit because I'm, I'm probably more likely to put in more than less. That's kind of my, my modus operandi. So <clears throat> I, I, I mean, I'm happy to do it again. I, I practically sat down to write the executive session notes in between just to kind of stay on top of it. And like the summer, I'm groovy. Let's have all kinds of meetings. I can take notes now. I've got much more time to myself, but I, I just felt so far behind um, and I feel badly. Yeah, so I, I do not deserve anybody's votes, but I'm happy to do it. We did discuss a couple of options, but Jen, you want to speak first and then we can talk about the options. Sure. So um, we're in the process of interviewing for the position and um, the, the assistant position in the building and um, land use office. So that's something that's been pretty important and part of all of the interviews that that we've conducted so far that they would be attending these meetings and flexing their time, preferably on Fridays because we're close to the public and being able to take minutes. So we're in the process. That would be great. And then I can review that with the, it, it's better that way than the other way, frankly. Right. So the other, I mean, yeah, the other couple of options we talked about um, as Rachel was just saying, December, May and September are her months when she's going to be slammed. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not we want to, you know, plan ahead and have someone sort of be the backup for, for those three months, that could be one way, or we could have like co-clerk or just whatever. So could we send and not have three meetings in a month? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I Could we? Over that. I'm sorry, who's talking? I can't see. I'm sorry, that was me, Kathy Wichoba. I was just thinking, could we send the audio or the link to a transcriber? Oh, that's well, too much. It's not easy. Like I do it from the I I'm do sure. it from the transcriptions. I just did the one that but they type up what you know what I mean? Like so they're not necessarily invested in in the meeting itself they're invested in transcribing after the fact yeah they you, you can get the transcription that's what i worked off of for the june 6th notes it's still not clear yeah sure. priscilla used to always struggle with it she just had the audio and she struggled with it i do it usually from the zoom tape and that in fact if when we get the planning or the building whatever so, the title is going to be. I mean, that would be a, tr not transcribed, but a a, um, a, tra a recording of the minutes that then Rachel could, or the clerk could work from, which could, should be easier, right? Should be. This is, this is Ann Mary, and I have to say that it's just as time consuming because you have to watch the whole thing. You know what I mean? Like, even if you have the transcription, it's not always that clear and there's a lot of editing that needs to be done if you're doing the transcription from the youtube like it's a huge amount of work well rachel if we were yes absolutely and thank you and and rachel for what you've done um rachel if um if we were if we were to elect you to the position and you know in november that next december you are just going to be not available at our november meeting right. I guess this is the question to everyone else on the board, not necessarily Rachel. Um, if we were to ask, okay, who can step up and maybe uh, yeah. follow through on the minutes on December? Would well, people... and if, the, if this works out, and there's Kathy lifting her hand, I love that. But if this also works out with uh, the person from the office, the yeah. from the land use office, then we're kind of we're good. Because that was the thing, Sue and I, Sue said, oh, I'll, do, you know, we, we were supposedly doing that, but we weren't. But I think with a more collaborative uh, modality there, would it would be doable. Kathy yeah. yeah, Sylvester? Uh, so, Jen, we explained to me this building assistant or whoever the title is, they're going to take the minutes. Do mm -hmm. one of us still have another duty to review them and read? I'm not sure what, what our responsibility is at that point. 
you have to review them. I mean, that, and that would yeah. make it easier. You have to review them and make sure that they say what, and that, that they're accurate. Happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this uh, person I, would need to attend the meetings, have some sort of format that, you know, I think Anne Mary's way, and it probably Rachel does it the same way of having spaces in your agenda and writing it in and taking the vote and writing all of those details down, um, be it, you know, be attending and so would know the process and what's happening in the meeting. However, then the person would then email those to the clerk to review and find to, you know, tooth it and then send that to the board for their approval at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. But it would be, I mean, having somebody that actually, like you can, you all would just be focusing on the meeting at hand, whereas the administrative staff person would be concerned about making sure it's all written down, that the vote is taken correctly, that, you know, you know how many times you guys have said, oh, well, one more thing, and then you jump back and then say, well, what about this? And then wait a second, did we actually really vote it or who said what or who seconded it? You know, all of that. So it's not on you, it's on the administrative staff person to keep track of that. And I think that that will be really beneficial. It will also help with um, knowing what's happening with the planning board and with other boards when it comes to decisions and filings and just knowing everything. When you're here and you're doing it, I wear a lot of different hats in my office, so I don't always keep track 100% of what the planning board is always doing. I'm wearing, I'm doing something different, whereas this person's going to have a more focused view. And thank you, Jen. Andrea? Um, Jen, do you have an idea when someone will be hired? Is it, does it look pretty imminent? Yes. Oh, that's nice. Good. All right. So we, it sounds like we do have a, it's going to be a work in process. I think, first of all, for everyone to realize that. Secondly, for us to realize that we are trying to have, well, as we were learning earlier, um, a draft of the minutes available within 10 days and then um, the minutes approved at the following meeting. So um, we can kind of try to have a little leeway with that, but uh, breathing room, but still that's the goal. So um, being um, having the need for people to maybe step up if in fact there needs to be some some coverage would be helpful. And I can do that. I mean, happy to, to do that. All right. All right. May we have maybe a, uh, a motion on nominating someone for the clerk? I make a motion to nominate Rachel Blaine. <laughs> I second. Kathy Wachroba. I second. Any any discussion? Other than thanks for what you've done already and the thought you've done. Yeah, well, really. thanks to Anne Mary too. She did this for a long time. So and it it it's one of those like when when you're on it, it's well, I just felt well and Rachel. Anyway, I hope you'll I would step up to do the September and May, but we're in the same situation. Exactly. <laughs> we're both teachers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Okay. okay. So um, uh, then if there's no more discussion, let's have a vote. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary Cloutier. Mary Cloutier, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba, yes. Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson, yes. And Emily Wolfkel, yes. So congratulations, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and then also as we uh, reorganization, I kind of over overlooked a wonderful um, offer for of Anne Mary Cloutier to uh, work on the Community Preservation Commission, uh, um, which is an appointed position from the planning board. Um, so, Anne Mary, thank you very, very much. Um, that would be an appointment, although we can still vote on it here. So, um, can we? And I don't know. And well, in the discussion, and Mary, if you want to <laughs> give your election speech, uh, may we have a uh, motion to um, approve the appointment of Anne Mary to the CPC? Andrea Leibson, I so approve. I so I still recommend. And I second the recommendation. 
Rachel Blaine. Thank you, Rachel Blaine. All right. Any any uh, discussion? All right. So um, we will have a vote. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary Cluyer. And Mary Cluyer, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy mm -hmm. Sylvester, yes. Uh, Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba, yes. Andrew Leibson. <coughs> Andrew Leibson, yes. Natalie Wolfpool, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and Mary, and again, Rachel. And Mary, so who's the chair of that now? I don't know. I was hoping someone was going to tell me that next. Yeah, well, I mean, it was Tim, but I don't think he's probably. Yeah, yeah I thought that it was Tim, too, until his election. Um, so I don't know. That was my last. That's what I thought, too. It was Tim. I'm not certain either. So I'll, um, yeah, uh, I, I can notify them that you're on it, whoever they are. I'll find out from Tim. Okay, yeah, I was just going to go on the town website and reach out that way, but I can also reach out to Tim. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. All right, and now our, our um, long suffering fee schedule. <laughs> Andrea? Uh, first, I want to apologize to everyone for the sketchy version that got sent to you. It's a little, um, it's got a lot of words on it, um, including words that have been removed, but I wanted people to see where we had started and where um, I'm hoping we will end with this document. Mm -hmm. The I met with, so we all discussed this at previous planning board meetings and we came up with an idea of what we thought the new fees should be. We decided those on May 9th. And I met with Casey and Brenda on June 29th and they looked at the numbers we had come up with and Casey had some suggestions oh thank you Whoop. there we go someplace those, those look delicious uh, mm -hmm. uh, casey had some suggestions that were a little higher so i sent you all a table that i hope you could see that showed what our fees had been when the last time they were approved which was in 2015. yes thank you um the fees that we determined um on may 9th and then the discussion with Casey about what she would recommend. And since she really knows how much time everything takes, I thought that her numbers were quite good, but of course I did not want to presume that uh, you would approve these without looking at them yourself. So I thought we would, I want, I'm prefacing the discussion of that big uh, document with these numbers. So please keep those in mind. Casey was very happy with the idea that we would be simplifying this, um, the document, uh, planning board regulations governing fees and fee schedules. So the last time it was revised, excellent. Thank you, Annalie. Last time it was revised was in 2015 and here are the revisions through June 29th. As I said, I was trying to do all of this work on an iPad. I am not the most adept uh, using Word on uh, an iPad. Could be me, could be the iPad. So I ended up using my husband's um, computer. His name is Jack Wilden. That's why his name is there um, on all the documents. I apologize for that. He did not enter anything. This was my work. It's just on his computer. It's and as a... Right, and as a little um, uh, uh, side information for you to know, I spoke to Casey about whether or not a laptop could be made available to board members, either planning board or other, um, other volunteers who work uh, on behalf of the town. And she made it uh, sound like it would be possible for there to be um, a laptop that would be fully loaded with office, the office suite. So I'm hoping that that happened or, or will happen in the near future. And then you don't have to see my husband's name again. Anyway, going through um, the document um, on page one, I did not believe there needed to be any changes. I'm not sure why things are, oh, what well, things are maybe, I don't know why they're underlined in, in green. I beats me, sorry about that. Um, under section 3.3, this is where things change. 3.3, it will now read administrative fees 
and then does not include costs for any technical, legal, and or planning consultants whom the planning board deems necessary. Okay, that is what 3.3 will say. And then we start with A, site plan review. Casey believed um, that $300 was appropriate and the rest of that will be uh, crossed off. In B, the um, wording should be amended site plan shall also require the fee specified above. And then I have a question about that, which I'll get to when I get to the very bottom of 3.3, of please. C would be special permit review of $300. D would be amended special permit shall also require fee specified above. E, approval not required, would be $150. F, preliminary subdivision plan would be would be $200 per proposed lot. G would be definitive subdivision plan would be $500 per proposed lot plus $100 uh, per lot. H would be amended definitive subdivision plan for $250. When we get to 3.4, it says, see the fees noted in section 3.3. One possibility that um, we could discuss is whether or not, for example, if you did a site plan review and then you amended it for $300 and then you amended it, should the fee again be $300 or should it be $250? Same is uh, true with special permit review. So if we decided to change all of the amended application fees to $250, we would change the wording in 3.4 to all amended plans have a fee of $250. Mm -hmm. And then we would remove B, D, and H. So that's something to think about. Should we stop there? You, do, do you wanna stop there or? I don't know, whatever you want. How, how's everyone doing? Shall I, shall I continue? I think it's easier if we just talk about that before moving on. Okay, so I just I wanted you to know that the word modified had previously been in these, uh, uh, in a, somewhere in A through H, and Casey told me that, in fact, they're not modified, they're amended, and that the form that people fill out is an amended form. And so we wanted the wording to be consistent. Okay, so what say you about the dollar amounts that Casey recommended? Do you think those are a good idea or do you want to stay with the $250, for example, for site plan review that we had thought previously? Andrea? Yes. I agree with raising them. I mean, I think there's a lot of work that goes into it, and especially, you know, on the town administration, that, you know, there's a lot of work, not just on our, our part, but their part. And I, th I don't think people understand how much work there is. No, I, I would agree. And, and I mean, Casey's the, is the, Casey and Jen are the experts. They're the ones who actually are there doing the yes. work. And if Casey thought it took more time and thus more expense, then I would follow her lead but I wanted to make sure that you all agreed. Yeah, we can make note with site plan review that um, the 300 is significantly more than the other towns that you um, researched. And that is true, but I, I showed Casey all of the other, um, the, the towns that we had done research on and she still thought the 300 was appropriate. Kathy Sylvester, do you have a question? Go ahead, Andrew. Well, I'm just, if you, make them all 250 that really changes it th th what the uh, what would be um 250 would be any amendment not all of the fees just the amendment oh, I fees. See. i see okay just the amend just if, if you came back if you did a site plan review and then you and then you uh, wanted it to be amended do we charge them 300 dollars again or do we decide 250 again i, I went with 
Casey thought if it's amended, it's it's more work, and that the higher um, mm -hmm. fee should be should be charged. I see. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. I do too. Mm -hmm. Feels good. So what we're talking about that might make sense then is that we say in 3.4 that amended applications are 250 and then she takes out the B, D, and G. H and H. H, uh-huh. So, so if we make them all $250, yes. Okay. Are, are people okay with that? I'm okay with it. Okay. 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 Re ready, to, ready to proceed? Yes. Okay. Um, in three point, not if you please the application. So three, uh, three point four. Can you go back down a little bit? So, the, so the amended application fees. Then it, we've simplified it. We've taken out a whole lot of words, and um, and we've just turned it to two fifty. That's great. Okay. So that's three point four. Um, in 3.5, there are no changes. 3.6, there are no changes. Uh, section four, we um, added the word consultant because project consult, it just was more um, explained better what the project review was. It wasn't just somebody reviewing it. It was that we uh, brought in a consultant to, uh, it's an expert to, um, to do the review. And so the word consultant got um, put in the title for section four, it got it added to 4.1. Um, so it's project consultant review. It was added to 4.2 project consultant review. And then in 4.3, we added it as well. In the past, 4.3 had a whole lot of dollar amounts for the size of properties, et cetera. And Casey just pointed out, we have no idea what an expert will charge. It's not really appropriate for us to uh, offer a dollar amount because it has, it has no basis in any kind of reality. And so we changed the wording to say that fees for consultant reviews vary mm -hmm. and that the consultant um, fees must be paid in, um, in advance of the planning board approval. So that, so 4.3 was much reduced mm -hmm. and much simplified. Um, and then in 4.4, here's the replenishment um, ideas. So it, where they have to pay for the consultant up front and as a consultant completes the work, they would be paid out of this 553G account but, um, well, and I'm, um, I may be misspeaking. There might be 53 G is where the money goes in, 53 I is where it comes out, but it, it's, uh, that's uh, a lot of detail that I don't think we really need to know. The important part is if it gets close to the end of a project and there isn't enough money to pay, then we would ask for a replenishment fee. So perhaps people would only pay you know, a certain amount. And then as the project uh, is reviewed and becomes more complicated, then it would, um, it would have to be replenished. So we don't anticipate that help happening a whole lot, happening a whole lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. 4.5, no changes. 4.6, no changes. Um, in 4.6 D1, as has happened throughout um, materials uh, in our town, select board is being um, put in and, and select board is one. I, I now have it fixed in other places. It is one word, no capital B. Okay, so, so select board is, um, is, is changed in um, D1, 4.7, um, there as well, 4.7a, 4.7d, and um, the last uh, change is in section six, which is uh, in 6.1b, 
it's effect, not affect. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> um, there we go. I will send you all a copy again with all of the tracking taken out so it's easier to read. Um, but there we go. I did again speak to Brenda along with Casey and this question of delinquent accounts did was discussed and the annual interest rate of 14% was discussed. It is apparently very rare for there to be delinquent accounts, but it does happen occasionally where a check is sent with along with an application and maybe bounces. <laughs> and so um, they are, I know that Brenda is currently chasing down some money from some something that has happened in the past that was um, that was delinquent, but it's very, but it's rare. So that 14% seems high, but it's also, it happens very rarely. All right, Andrea. Woo. And, and yeah, yeah. Any, any other questions? This does mean that the documents for um, uh, site plan review, special permit, a and will all have to be looked at to make sure that the dollar amounts are correct. And um, so I, I will I will work on that next once we have your approval. Also now this of course will need to go to a public hearing um, so that the public has a chance to comment on these changes. All right, so um, let's see, I'm thinking whether or not our, if we have a vote, it would be to um, approve the fee regulations and schedules as amended and hold a public hearing on August 1st, 2020. As long as the timing is okay, that oh. the timing has to be uh, determined by, um, I think Jen can help us with that. What do you mean by timing? Uh, the, 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 the hearing, public hearing has to be posted a certain number of days in advance. Oh, right, right, yeah, we'd have, we have enough time for that, right? Because we've got three weeks and we need to have it two weeks uh, weekly and uh, consecutive, correct, Jen? That's correct. Yeah. Maybe maybe what we could do is have a motion just to approve um, these and then um, with some discussion. Um, actually, I'm interested in what Ken's thoughts are with them also. Yeah, Ken. <laughs> you, you, sorry, go ahead. Um, Ken, if you want to speak in now, we're not we're not having the motion yet, I guess. I don't know. You just worked on fee schedules. How does this look? Well, I, I, I think the, um, the notion that you, the, the, the board may be adopting specifically with a singular fee rather than based on square footage, especially that's just too difficult sometimes to administer, especially if you have to look at like a solar project, then you're like, what do I measure? Do you measure the, you know, the solar array or do you measure mm -hmm. the, um, mm -hmm. um, so, um, I think, I think it's great that, that you've, you've come around to that. I, um, with regards to the, um, I think the, the, probably the, 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 the biggest, um, you know, what I <coughs> mostly was, um, your project consultants, your um, that specific review process that you employ there, um, and that's particular to thinking like the replenishment. I'm I'm curious about how how that would work. Um, I'm not quite sure if the expectation. Um, I know in some communities um, they ask depending on if they're planning to use a you know, a project consultant. Um, and this is particular to um, a community that um, had uh, solar as well as a cannabis. And they asked for 10,000 off the bat for a project review. Um, and that's submitted with the application. Um, was it all used? No. Um, so there was some accounting that obviously took place there. Um, what I will say too is, um, some, particularly if I'm part of that process, you're gonna want me to charge the applicant 
um, for my time. So you, so the board doesn't have to pay for that. So I think just being mindful that, right. um, and then it could also like lengthen the time, especially if you have an applicant that, you know, may not be forthcoming or not be as responsible with regards to, to paying the, those particular fees um, before the public hearing or before um, an approval is, is granted. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think um, the, the fees that you've listed uh, prior to this uh, seem fine. Um, I think they're, they're in that ballpark. Um, some communities that I've worked with don't necessarily charge for the amended site plans. Um, some do. Um, yeah, but I think it's the, it's the consultant review fees that I think maybe um, just trying to understand how with that, with that particular process, how that would play out. Um, and I don't know if, I, I, I didn't read all of this, um, but if there's you know, a specific process that's laid out that could be very helpful um, to the applicant and to the board, especially if they're waiting for some sort of payment for a review by planning or engineering um, outside of the town. One of our, I'm not sure that the, this regulation schedule is the place for this. We did have, and Rachel will certainly remember from a prior time, our prior mm -hmm. board a couple, our board a couple, couple of terms ago, um, the question of getting peer review, making sure that the applicant hey. signed off on the peer review before we signed the contract. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, that process didn't happen in that order, and ultimately the town was left mm -hmm. on the hook. So, um, well, um, and Annalie, if I may uh, jump in, I believe we ch the, the forms have all been changed. We talked about that in an earlier meeting a while ago, and I believe that was to try to remedy such a situation. That in fact, it did happen, it was a bad thing, and um, so the forms got changed. So, so that that shouldn't happen again. That's that's my recollection. Jen can um, can um, bear me out. The other thing it, to rem remember is that these this this document is supposed to be reviewed annually. <laughs> if we think it hasn't worked or hasn't captured everything we would like it to, we now will have some new information. We'll have new fees out there, and we can look next year and see if they worked. If they didn't work, we can change them again. Good point. I also think that we're gonna to have to take some, I mean, see what the public comments are, fee yes. changing, you know, and how that affects and what sort of, I mean, I understand Casey's point and Brenda's point of increasing fees. I'm on the other end of dealing with the constituents and applications and um, we just have to see how that is. And are we creating a situation that becomes for a small owner, landowner or something onerous, you know, problematic? I mean, so anyway, that would be good input from the public. Yeah. Just FYI, Andrea, rock on. This is really yeah. a ton of work <laughs> and I really appreciate it. And I was around in 2014 when we did this and it was Pat Smith that did all this work. Huh. So you, you keep track of that because she mm -hmm. was the one that plowed us through what we have in front of us tonight. Thank you. I mean, what you worked on. Yeah, well, good on her. <laughs> all right. Um, well, could we have a motion then to approve the uh, Planning Board regulations governing fees and fee schedules as amended. As revised June 29th, 2022. I move that we. Oh, oh as revised July 11th, 2022. Oh, yes, July 11th. Good yes, night. yes, 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 yeah. yes. Thank you. I move, I so move. Rachel Blaine. Hey, Mary Cloutier, I second. Thank you, Mary. Any, uh, any further discussion? <clears throat> All right, I will have a vote then, Denise Mason. Ms. Mason, yes. <clears throat> Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary Cloutier. And Mary Cloutier, yes. Kathy Sylvester. 
Oh, Ooh, Kathy, I think you're there. Sorry, I can't be Sylvester, yes. Um, Kathy Watroba. How do I stop? It's muted. Kathy Watroba. Kathy, can you hear me? Actually, just unshare. We can give her a wave. Yeah, yeah new share. What's the deal? I don't want to share that. Oh, stop share. There we go. Did you hear me? Now we can see you. <laughs> Kathy Wittrova, yes. Thank you. Uh, Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson, yes. And Lou Wolf Cool, yes. So the um, fee schedule uh, regulations are approved as amended. And um, I, I will, will send out a new version to everyone um, in the next day or so. Okay. without the tracking of, of changes. Um, we need to no set a the public it. hearing and that might pop us ahead a little bit on our agenda. I've heard from um, actually, it appears that three of us are gonna be certainly out of town, out of state. And I'm not sure how many people are available for um, August 1st, but um, do we have a quorum? Do we have people? who are going to be available August 1st, our regularly scheduled meeting. Only uh, one we... will not be available on August 1st, unfortunately. So okay. Only one so that I... I won't be available. And Kathy, not available either. And I'll be on the West Coast. I can still mm. do it, but it's a bit of a challenge. Um, I don't know what's harder to try to reschedule or just go forward with August 1st. Everyone else, Kathy, would trouble well, everyone else. If, if we don't have an August meeting and no one's going to, we can do it in September. September. It's not, I mean, also, unless something comes year. up. Yeah, I don't think we had an August meeting last year either. Yeah. It's oh, not my the God. Worst. I like that. The French do it all the time. They do nothing in August. Or you can change it to the next week. Or the, ne yeah. the next meeting, the September meeting? No, I, no, can't you change the date? I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else that's coming up that is critical. And if so, change to the following week. Yeah, I, I'm on call that night. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. The thing is, uh, the only thing that we would, if there was an ANR that came in, then we had to respond. You know, something that came in that we had to respond. It does seem that there are um, a couple of possible things. I am not available August 8th. How about August 15th? Is that the 15th? I don't, uh, I can do it. August 15th? Are people available August 15th? Do we have? Via oh. Zoom. Yeah, I can zoom in. Uh, well, I, I'm anticipating we're going to stay hybrid until yeah. Charlie tells us no. <laughs> so, no. Um, all right. So why don't we have our next meeting? Or I, although I really love the French idea. But, <laughs> I'm totally down for that. Why don't we... Um, why don't we plan on August 15th and... Um, Potentially, if in fact this is the only thing on the agenda, which is probably doubtful, um, we could risk, you know, we could have that public, we can make a decision and have a public hearing in, in November. In November. In September. September. Yeah, all right. Those well, the French aren't that loose. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so then um, would that be in addition to the August 1st or instead of? Instead of instead of and um, maybe our our vote for the public hearing i don't really know that we have to have it as a vote for, to bring it to public hearing but let's i don't know jenna ken do we have to have a vote to, for the public hearing i don't think so do we we maybe i think what it would be is that we would have it at our next regularly scheduled um planning board meeting and that maybe august 15th and maybe september well, I think you have to set a date, don't you, Ken? Yeah, I think you do too. But I, I think we just set it for September twelfth. I mean, this is great work, but then we're not we're not in any kind of terrible way, and we can. I don't, I'm not really pushing for to skip the month. But. 
in September, you and Aunt Mary with school starting. Yeah, but well, I mean, I've been doing it in September forever. It's just taking the notes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I a month. That we could have a public hearing in September, and then, in fact, if we if we do need to have a meeting in August, we can still have a meeting in August. It's just not with public hearing. All righty, so we will have our public hearing on this on September fifteenth. 12th. Pardon me? September 12th. Oh, yes, the 12th. Sorry, I wrote that down. Wrong. Yes, September 12th, 2022 is the public hearing. And um, with uh, the, just as an aside, our meeting for August 15th to be determined according to agenda items that are submitted. Cool. Okay. Moving right along to from just one fun thing to the Dan's next. Got a question? Yes. Sorry. Are we, are we now not having it on the first at all? You're just making your regular meeting on the fifteenth, or do you want to keep the first for whoever can attend? And no, no. 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 Okay. The first is canceled, and we will let people know whether or not we will have it on the fifteenth. Is that okay? As needed. As needed. Yes, PRN as needed. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good to clarify. All righty. Um, geez, it's only eight ten, Kathy. <laughs> Go for it. Accessory apartment work group. Okay. So we had our last meeting, uh, June twenty eighth. Um, we still have not got amended bylaws yet. Um. Uh, Chris is on vacation, so Anna Lee and I are meeting with him on the 20th of July and trying to iron out some discrepancies in his notes and our notes and what exactly was decided. Um, however, there's a few points I wanted to go over, and I wonder if I could share my screen with you here. If I know how to do this, which, of course, you know. And do they have... Um... Oh, good. She must. Yes, Kathy's. So um, there's a couple of questions about, you know, whether there's some pending legislation currently that may make our attempt at this bylaw moot. So Chris had looked into it for us, and there was some legislation passed last year um, that was encouraging, which says um, in this first section here and what I'm sharing um, that essentially the upshot of all this language is that if we want to amend or change the bylaw on ADUs, it can be passed in town meeting with a simple majority. It does not need to be passed by two thirds majority of the town. So that was encouraging. Um, the, the state is trying uh, or at least some people in the um, legislature are trying to encourage more ADUs. So they changed the language. And there is some current legislation in committee right now uh, that says the way Kristen's saying he interprets it would just enable the town's ability and option to rezone for ADUs through a simple majority at town meeting. So um, if we wanted to adopt an accessory dwelling zoning district, for instance, we could come up with a bylaw changing uh, a zoning district and pass it through town meeting with a simple majority. So that's where the legislation is currently. So it, it still means that we need to work on this bylaw. I mean, nothing's going to make it not um, relevant. It's, you know, we still need to decide what our bylaw is going to say. It's just a matter of how we're going to get it passed and what it takes to get it passed. So some of the items in discussion, and I don't know if you have the latest amended bylaw um, proposed draft, but on 3920, um, there was a lot of discussion about the size um, and the current language uh, says, and I'm just looking at for now, 
The current language says the maximum gross floor area of the accessory apartment shall not exceed 30% of the gross floor area of the dwelling or 1200 square feet maximum, whichever is lesser in size. And in no event, however, will the apartment be required to be smaller than 800 square feet. So that's what the current language says. Um, we had some discussion about whether or not we could say that it could be as large as 1,200 square feet, um, half the floor area of the principal dwelling, or 1,200 square feet, whichever smaller, or simply half the floor area of the principal dwelling or 1,200 square feet would not be required to be less than 1,200 square feet. So that, that's still in process. Um, I don't know, Anna Lee, how you... Well, and then we've also questioned whether or not it, in no situation should it be less than 900 square feet. I kind of remember something from some other town and maybe Ken or Jen, you know this, um, I was somehow remembering a 950. So I guess the question, maybe just to see how the planning board is feeling about sort of size requirements or do we do we feel that we could have it be let's say no less than x which might be 900 that's kind of what we've been talking about right Kathy we had and then the discussion at our last meeting some people said 1200 and I think Chris's point which nobody else I mean Annalie and I are aware of in his notes is that he said he didn't think we could put language in saying it's in would not be required to be less than but there's no requirement we're just simply saying we wouldn't limit the size. Like if you said half the square, half the floor area of the principal dwelling or 1200 square feet, whichever is smaller, that could be pretty small if your home is 1500 square feet. But in no, in no instance would it be less than either 800. Right. Which is a different language than what Chris was saying that he said, I don't think you can put in um, that there, that we are requiring it to be using the word required is different than saying it wouldn't. Oh, not, you know, oh. I mean, he, he, he was coming at it a little different. I, I think he was misunderstanding our language. Anyway, oh. I'm going to confuse the board because. And, and maybe, um, do you have any ideas on this? I mean, it really is up to the board and, you know, what the appetite is for the size of, um, um, you know, what numbers you used for those two instances. I've seen it done with a 900 square feet with half of the floor area of the principal dwelling, um, whichever is uh, lesser. Um, I think, uh, you know, and I need, I would need to review this. Um, I know that there's some conversation, especially regarding um, how the housing choice bill that um, Kathy alluded to, which would require a simple majority if this is by right versus special permit. Um, and there needs to be also um, a um, just review of, of the components of the, site, um, of the ADU bylaw, especially if the intention is to have um, to make it easier to develop ADUs um, versus whether or not you're creating, um, you know, specific criteria that would they that particular voting threshold and um, wouldn't um, apply to this instance. I think that's just my only comment um, initially. Just you know, looking as it as you're presenting it. So I think that at the meeting, my understanding was people were trying to be generous in saying um, they were going to take out the words, whichever is smaller. That's what I took away from that meeting. So that if you had a 1,600 square foot home, you could say the AD that 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 the ADU was 
uh, not going to be required to be less than it could be half the size or 1200 square feet but not required to be less than 1200 square feet that's what i thought we heard there but i don't know what the board's feeling is about that denise or kathy if you want to call on people instead of me oh i'm sorry i don't see everybody because oh, okay. i'm sharing yeah, the screen yeah. so right. i can't uh, see everybody okay denise sure. Denise? Just a couple of comments. Uh, yeah, I think it should be, you know, even if a home is 1,600 square feet, square feet, I think 1,200 is fine. And, you know, really look back to the reason of ADUs. You know, first of all, I think people want ADUs to be, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, an aging parent or maybe, you know, it's a kid that just graduated from college, you can't afford to live on us, you know, who knows. But I think most of these will happen within town where there is sewer because if not, you know, to try and put it on a place, for instance, I'm on septic, and for me to do something like that, I would have to upgrade my septic system to the tune of, you know, who knows, $20,000 or more plus the build. So I think it's highly unlikely that people are going to be jumping and saying, hey, I want to do an ADU. So right. I think it's more realistic. It'll happen within town. And then you've got to think about the space. So I think 1,200 square feet is, is an adequate space. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Jen? Anybody else? To, um, Kathy, Kathy usually brings back the uh, gist of the discussion at the planning board to the work group. So Jen has her hand up. Oh, yeah. and Mary does as well. Do you want to listen? Oh, to I can't see her. I'm sorry. I don't see everybody. I'll say something after Anne Mary speaks. speaks. Okay. Hi there. Um, thanks, Jen. So I think, and I'm not going to speak for Chris, but what is making sense to me is that we're talking about an over or under, right? So it shouldn't be more than a third, for example. But I think that saying that it has to be more mm -hmm. than a certain number would be, I feel like that would be outside of our purview. I don't think that we can say it has to be more than 900 feet or it has to be more than 1200 feet. But I think that we can say it can't be more than a third or it can't be more than a half. Um, but maybe I'm confused. No, I think the point was to say that, um, you know, we wouldn't require it to be less than 1200 square feet. If you wanted it to be less, that's shipped to you. But it, okay. you know, we're saying it's half the floor area and your house is 1,600 square feet. Right. Half of that would be 800. So if we said half the floor area of the principal dwelling or 1,200 square feet um, and just... But it's a cannot exceed that, right? What, what I think what we were talking about, and it's not in this language that is written here, was that it wouldn't, it would no case would it be required to be less than 1200 square feet is what I'm trying to say. So a person could do it if they wanted to, they could have it 600 square feet if they wanted to, but they wouldn't be required, no matter what size their house is, we're not gonna require them to have it less than gotcha. 100 square feet. Gotcha. So, I, yeah. And then on the other end, I mean, we, we this talks about 30% of the principal dwelling versus the 50%. So we're saying that it's in no, it can be 1200 square feet, but no greater than either 30 or 50% of the principal dwelling. Yeah, so, uh, so it would, the, the beginning part here is what it says now, and this really isn't, I don't know if Chris wrote this or what, it's not accurate. Um, it should say, or it, you know, half the floor area, the principal dwelling or 1200 square feet, but in no event should, will the apartment be required to be less than X, which we thought 1200 square feet was adequate. So it couldn't, you know, you couldn't make it be less than 1200. So that should be re. I guess I'm confused because I think and Mary uh, Mary said that there's a, a minimum and a maximum. What are we saying is the minimum and the maximum? 
I think we're, yeah, so. <laughs> the maximum would be 1,200 square feet. But I don't, I don't know that. No, the maximum would be either a third or a half, right? The maximum would be either a third or a half of the square of the, um, yeah, the area of the house. No, square footage of the house. Um, right, so it couldn't be bigger than a third of the house or bit, take up more space than a third or take up more space than a half. I think half is too much. I just want to put that out there. Um, okay. And well, I think yes, if you had a 4,000 square foot house, it could be a 2,000 square foot ADU. Um, right. So, and I think then, then you have a duplex, right? Then you have, so I think the notion of it needs to be a smaller proportion, like a third. And I think that if we stick to that proportion, that it can't be bigger than a third and don't give it a square footage. Is that something that we could consider? It well, seems simple. Because some of these units could be detached or added on, even if they are attached, right? So if you have a 1,200 square foot house and you want to add an ADU and you're saying 300, I mean, 30 percent, that's, you know, 400 square feet, that's not going to work, right? And it's too small. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um So we can struggle because, as you can see, we're doing now. <laughs> hey, Kathy. Yeah. Denise, just put not greater than 1,200 square feet. 30% or not greater than 1,200 square feet. You know, having it larger sort of negates the whole purpose, in my mind, of an ADU. Well, we don't want it larger than the... Um... So that's what I'm saying, 1,200 square feet. I mean... Yeah. yeah. What if it's larger than... The principal dwelling. Principal dwelling might be 1,200 square feet. Right. So you're going to have a duplex <sighs> or you'll have a, it, you, I mean, uh, so I worked a lot on this when I was in Amherst and there, um, they had different categories. So they had supplemental one, supplemental two. They gave extra square footage to making it ADA compliant because you need more room for wheelchairs and accessibility. Um, they also um, have language about it being no more than 50% of the size of the actual dwelling. Um, then they have the ones that are attached versus detached. So that also goes in hand in hand with what you were saying, Denise, about being connected to sewer. Mm. Because, you know, uh, so, I mean, I don't think it needs to be one category. It could be several mm -hmm. different categories, some yeah. with special permits, some as, a, as of right, um, suiting different needs for different purposes. Somebody may want a rental property that's it's a detached, but some may want it to be attached because they're family member, you know, so, um, yeah. Well, maybe, oh, go on, Denise. Just a quick one. So, Jen, you know, since you did work on that, is it possible for you to get that language and give it to the committee so they could review that and maybe add that to this document? Sure. Possibility. Mm -hmm. Would that yeah. be helpful? That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can submit to you. Too. Yeah, and maybe since we don't have a strong consensus on this, we can we still just probably have discussion at the. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is Andrea. Can I ask, does Ken have any expertise in this? Can he provide any language with some of the towns that he has worked with? Sure. Let's, let's, let's crib from the best. I mean, let's, we don't have to yeah. reinvent the wheel if somebody's got something that works. Yeah, I can definitely share any language. Um, we just completed one for the town of Worthington. Um, after a full year of back and forth, uh, <laughs> we, you know, they were successful and able to get it before town meeting and approved. Um, and it was 900 or half, um, whichever was smaller, um, a, both a detached product and an attached product. Um, they may have changed something else, but I don't recall. But I know in having worked with them, um, those were the types of conversations that they were having. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, sure, Bruce, go ahead, briefly. 
We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Okay, I just had a comment on the 3920. Um, one, uh, I would assume that you're talking uh, floor area, live, living space, yes, because yeah, you, we... you, it, it's, not, it's not specified living space when you're de dealing in, in this thing here. So that could be construed as the floor place of a dwelling unit, part of a garage, a huge storage area or something like that. And I'm not sure that's what you really want to include it. My second comment would be, and I haven't read the language uh, specifically, but I think the 900 foot that, that allows you a majority rather than a, a two thirds uh, vote at town meeting is for 900 feet or less. I think when you go over that, it, it, you have to go back to two thirds majority to pass that if I'm not mistaken, maybe no. there, uh, pardon? Oh, I just think, okay, I, that's not something that was included in what Chris's language, what he shared with us. So I'd have to check with him, but I can check with him. Yeah, I, you know, I may, I, I may be mistaken, but I think it, you do need to check that. Because if I remember reading it a year or so ago, it was if the um, article allowed 900 feet or less, it could go on the floor with a majority uh, ruling. Okay. Hmm. I'll just check that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I think if you if you get the whole bylaw, it does lay in other areas, um, state living area and what that means. It, you know, it defines that. So it's not garage or Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm just I'm just reading what you have here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You no, know, but thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, so we did want some more definition of a detached building has a permanent foundation because, the, of course, the comment about um, tiny houses on wheels or mobile homes or whatever came up. So um, we're going to add that to the bylaw to define what a detached ADU is. Um, a big discussion around 3934, number four. Um, if some people on the planning board might remember a year ago, a couple from Alaska who owned property here rented out one unit. They wanted to keep the other one available for when they came back into town. And our bylaw, um, you know, doesn't allow for long lengths of absence. Um, so we talked a lot about that. We had considered putting in a limit of six months of absence, but you know, I brought up the, the the idea that a single family home, I could rent out my home for as long as I want, right? It's a single family home. I decide to rent it. I moved to Alaska for five years. I don't think we should put a limit on how long you're away, but rather put a limit on you cannot rent both units because now if you do that, it's no longer an ADU, it's a rental property a two family or or whatever so we're still haven't finalized that part of the language but um i guess the question is do we need to specify a length of absence is it just enough to say in a residence with an accessory apartment only one unit can be rented which then puts them more on equal footing with a single family home that can rent or an undetermined length of time. I don't know how people feel about that. Denise? I have a comment. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, first of all, for, you, when you're putting a time limit, you have to think about enforcement. Who's going right. out to enforce that? Yep. You know, I mean, what are you going to drive by and see so someone's there every day? So I think yep. that's that's difficult. Yeah. Jennifer? So uh, again, this is something else that the board can decide or not decide to do is like in Amherst, they have the rental permitting program where they have to register and they get $100 per apartment, no matter, no matter if they have 250 apartments or one apartment, um, they have to register it. And with that comes a fee, but they also have somebody that's monitoring it. So we don't have the staff to do that right now. Right. However, 
um, an option that could be is if there is a special permit with any of these properties that they have um, somebody within so many miles that is it could either be the homeowner or it could be a rental company or somebody who's going to make sure that there's somebody that the renter can contact for maintenance issues or that it doesn't get left to be run down if somebody is away for six months. And I mean, they also had a checkbox if somebody was away on sabbatical because in Amherst it's a university community, so people leave. And so they had short-term rentals, which was half the price of the other rental registration. It's just keeping in mind that, that, that there's somebody that the, it it's, serves a couple purposes. It serves that the, um, the, the property doesn't get run down and that the, the town has somebody to contact if it does get run down, but it's also for people who um, live close by, but are also like that the, the tenants can reach out. So it's something that the tenants can also use and it has to be posted. Who's going to be the contact person for any maintenance issues in the town in a way that the town can do it without having to have the extra sort of, you know, the building on the building commissioner or somebody else is that it's attached to the special permit that they have to give this copy to all of their tenants that has somebody within a radius of like 20 miles, 25 miles. So would you do that for a single family home if somebody decided to rent out their home? Right. And that's with the rental registration program. They would have to do that for a single family home. Okay. Um, I mean, I think if it, but see, that wouldn't fall in our category, whereas we don't have the staff to do that. But let's say um, it, there was a special permit for their accessory dwelling. So I, I, that's the only way I can see that we would be able to manage that in, at this stage in the game. Yeah. So that would be for accessory dwellings, but not for single family home rentals. Right, because we don't have a yeah, we wouldn't we don't have the staff right now to do a rental registration program and have somebody that's, you know, monitoring it because that is an immense amount of time. Right. So how do you determine if somebody doesn't file a permit? Well, <laughs> that was my first job when I worked in Amherst. So I became Detective Jen and, you know, I would see all of these rentals that I would find people, single family homes, two family homes, ones that didn't have, um, that had, you know, illegal, um, you know, in-law apartments and all sorts of things. I mean, they just come up and I just sort of was like finding them. They just came out of the woodwork. Wouldn't be that way for Deerfield. So I don't know. I don't know how you could attach it here it would be something that's like oh, really? property oh, we, already, we already know from this committee that there are a number of um unpermitted adus yeah and so, it's really um complaint driven it is and and so then it's like you know how does it get attached to the property card or how do we identify it and who's the person that's going to go out and see um I mean, one thing that I found with a lot of these apartments was then finding that they didn't have the right um, fire separation or smoke detectors or means of egress. And it was then actually asking the homeowner that was been collecting rent for, you know, forever, um, you know, to be into compliance. So that was part of it was making the self health and self well being of those homes. Um, up to a certain standard. Good. So that's what we found. We, we found a lot of apartments that were, uh, you know, they would have a bed next to the furnace. And I mean, like cr crazy things. And so it would, it would just be, um, it also gave, um, you know, a lot of, well, that again, that town is student driven. So it's like a lot of parents would see these apartments and then they had somewhere to call and be like, you know, um, we, we want our kids to be safe and so I don't know I mean the town has to decide what they would like how far do they want to take um, the ADU and and what kind of regulation and what kind of fees and then what does that put on to additional staff right so Ken, oh. do you have any comments about that 
I mean, you hit it right on the head with regards to enforcement, um, and that you know was a challenge all always. Um, and but I think that the permitting mechanism for an ADU is to ensure at least initially, um, and if there is a what we call a look back. I don't know if you're if an intention of the board is to also try to bring folks up to compliance um, for those that are listed, or if this is just for all any type of new ADU. Um, so I think that's you know something that if you know the if there's a consideration for voluntarily bringing your property up to compliance um, or creating a language um, to suggest that you know you may be non-compliant with zoning after a certain amount of time. Um, so that's I mean that's something to consider with regards to um, enforcement of the the current um, um, the current property owners that have that infraction or where you know as planning board members passing by a home that they're operating or they have an accessory dwelling unit. Um, you know and I think yeah that that is typically where the conversation you know kind of has this like holding point um, because it's it's getting the planning board to agree that you know and, and then working with the building department to ensure that they have the support and the capacity to do what is asked of them based on you know what the planning board may be suggesting and then obviously town meeting approving that um i think one of the other things um you know that probably can be considered too and i know that um the question about vacations came up um you know if you have if you're a property owner and you happen to be away from your home for a certain amount of time again it's it's a it's, and I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you have this in your bylaw, but um, having that applicant um, file some sort of affidavit, either with the um, the permit initially, or you know, and and doing some sort of documentation that way, um, that's something that could be built into the um, the bylaw. But that, those are just some of the the interactions that I've had with communities that have adopted ADUs, um, family members, um, you know, the, the length of vacations and or the town knowing about whether or not those two buildings, whether the principal and the accessory dwelling unit are operating as rentals, um, that's a concern. Um, yeah, I, I think that there, you know, there just may be some additional questions and I think it's great that you're continuing to talk about this and, and seeking um, some other um, communities that have had experiences. With yeah, these. certainly. I mean, Kathy, uh, well, Chris, at the beginning of this uh, surveyed five or six adjoining towns, and when they passed their ADU laws, they were getting two and three ADUs a year. So it's not. It's not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, Kathy, whoo. <laughs> All right, um, well, we'll see where we go. We probably, what Kathy will be maybe having another meeting with the work group. Probably gonna have to, yeah, after we meet with Chris, yeah. Complex, okay. Thank you, Kathy, thank you. <laughs> I think what was great at the work, group, the work group meeting is just to keep bringing up these same issues that the hot button issues. And um, Chris had taken, um, he had affordable housing units, increased affordable housing units, and we've yeah. taken out affordable. And he felt like that was a hot button issue. And it's like, not in the same way that he was pointing to. We were saying they're not necessarily affordable. And so you you can't promise one way or the other that they may cost less because they're smaller, but you just you just have to say that it's increasing housing inventory. Right, right, right. And then I think you know the a townsperson brought up the impact on schools, and Kathy had a very good some very good data for that. The kind of things that just just keep fleshing out those concerns that people would have about special permitting for detached, et cetera, et cetera. So, um. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Woo. <laughs>
<laughs> Hope you feel like you have a few steps forward. Yep. Um, let's see. Our um, for some of our follow up, uh, the uh, subsidized housing inventory is still a work in process. So Jen and I got some an offer for help that wasn't really much of an offer for help. So she and I are going to talk about that. <laughs> but you know. Um, Bottom line is obviously Deerfield needs to increase its affordable housing, but right now we just try to get the baseline down. Um, I don't think we have a, a report on Ember Gardens yet. Our know. monthly report, you mean? Well, the last we'd heard was that they were just getting their um, Triple C Cannabis Commission, whatever it is, um, uh, paperwork done. And so potentially they haven't even started any construction yet. Mm -hmm. So I would expect that our, at our next meeting, we can have an, a monthly report to begin, we hope. And our professional development is a week from um, today. Is that right? Oh my gosh, yes, a week from today. So everybody bring your old binders, right? Denise, uh, Jen, anything else you wanna to add to that? I have a bunch that I printed out. And so maybe you and I, Annalie, could get together because I printed everything set for months ago when we were supposed to meet. So I don't want to, I want to sort of go through that and make sure that that is still up okay. to date for now and that we're not duplicating any more details that you want, would like me to um, print out and have available. Okay. Uh, Denise, you want to be part of that or are you CCIing? No, no, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. You know, be okay. part of that if, if you need we'll help. Cool. Okay. Um, other business not reasonably anticipated. Then we'll have public comments. All right. Um, public comments. Um, maybe I'll scoot ahead to mail. We did receive a, um, this will probably tie into the public comments, um, a, um, uh, well, Den I will um, let Denise introduce the, the uh, petition that we received since I'm in a butter to a butter and am recusing myself from the conversation. Um, so Denise, if you want to introduce the petition that we received and then we can have co public comments about that or anything else. Yeah, I mean, we did receive a petition this afternoon sometime, but you know, I just wanted to relate to anybody who's on, I know Bruce is on and others, pertains to the Snowberry Court. And just to let people know that we do have a policy that we want anything pertaining to our meeting to receive that by close of business day on Thursday so that everyone has ample time to, you know, to read through things. So since we did receive that today, you know, um, we won't be discussing that, that petition. And I'm not sure whether we're <laughs> the right body to actually Talk about that petition at this point. But you know, I we can do two one of two things. I think there are a couple people on, and I'm assuming that they're gonna talk, maybe some from Snowberry Court, maybe um others, but I mean I can I'll be happy to listen to a public comment. Uh, each person get can get two to three minutes. Um, I'm not going to respond to that, but in the end I will I will make a I'll make a statement of what I know to date about what the situation. Denise, do you want to call on people? Um, sure. If you can see them, yeah. Bruce, I'll call on you first. Two to three minutes, and I'm timing you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think I'm on at this point. Yep, you're uh, on. I'm here to express my concerns about flooding at Lot B, aka 69 Sugarloaf Street from the overflowing of the Northwest infiltration basin of the Sugarloaf condominium project that happened on February 3rd and 4th of 2022. This area is shown on the definitive subdivision plan pages four, eight and 11 of 28 pages. I have videos of this event from the morning of February 4th, 2022. This could be called quote, an operational failure. And if it is the stormwater regulations, SWR section 10, Point zero D addresses the requirement for the permittee to resolve any issue at permittee's expense. Even though the ground was partially frozen at that time, 
I submit that based on the requirement of SWR 6.0M, that the standards, quote, are met in all seasons, unquote, would preclude the excuse of the ground being partially frozen. This was discussed by Sarah Campbell at a planning board meeting in 2017. Lots A, 67th Sugarloaf Street and B are not part of the condominiums of Sugarloaf and, cannot, and can be sold by Ragus LLC, the present owner, to anyone at any time. I'm not sure the previous planning board was aware of this when they approved the plans that any overflow of the infiltration basin would flood a budding private property. Also, the grading around lot one building on the condominium project is pitched to drain onto lot B as was approved by the previous planning board. The lot one building is less than 12 feet from the property line. The previous planning board also approved the location of an oil water separator, one dry well and a manhole to be located on lot B and one drop, dry well to be located on lot A, again on private property. It appears that this is an, there is an easement to the town but not the condominium association, even though the condominium association is responsible for maintenance of those structures for the stormwater operation and maintenance plan on those lots. There also appears to be a row of arborvitaes planted in the easement. I've personally seen lots of tenants on lot A change their oil in the driveways uh, on their vehicles. Uh, the uh, tenant in lot B gardens along there has rota tilled up the bank and so forth. And every time he overwaters or the heavy, uh, heavy rains, dirt washes from his garden area across the driveway through the grass and into the drywall. Again, the HOA has no authority at this damage because it is on private property. I had requested on June 23 and July, July 5th to be put on the agenda for tonight's meeting so there would be time to express other concerns about administration and enforcement concerning this project, but it was not included. I have previously submitted letters and documentation to both the planning board and select board with concerns and have had little, re little or no response to those concerns. I've been requesting that the numerous changes from the approved plans be verified that they were submitted, reviewed, and approved by the planning board as required by the stormwater re regulations. No more, no less. Thank you for your time. Through St. Peter's 19B Snowberry Circle, South Deerfield, Mass. And now I'll say hello because I didn't want to run into uh, my three minutes. And no, <laughs> good job, Bruce. That was three minutes. You get uh, prize in that one. What's that? I said that was exactly three minutes. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, I mean, yes. you know, that, that's that's a lot to digest, and you know, I'm not going to respond to that. But I think um, I don't expect you to. Yeah, if you want, you can. You're welcome to submit that. Yes, I so will. that we have a record of that. I think that would be really helpful. Uh, is it okay to email you, or uh, would you um, rather have the hard copy? If you can email that to Jennifer. Okay. Jennifer, Jennifer just re get rejected, so I'll have to come in and see her. <laughs> okay, okay. For some reason, they bounce back. Or you can send it to Pat and tell her to send it to me because that worked too. Okay, That's all right. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, next, uh, Leslie. Do I see Leslie? Going once, going twice, Leslie. There's nope. no hand up. Okay, um, I mean, Jen, can you? You see, or do anybody else, does anyone else have a hand up? Nope, nobody else has their hand up. Oh, okay. Um, Michael, we've got Anne's tablet, and then I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, Marsh Marshall. Hi, Marshall. Yeah. No, it's, um. nobody has their hands up, so. Hmm. All right, thank you. Hi. All right. Um, any reports from any of the committees? Um. Uh, Denise. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll do a quick report. Been a little busy. We, and I don't recall whether we had this before, but we did. You can remind me if, if I did report on this, but we did um, have a presentation for Mass Works a couple weeks ago. And just to talk about the situation in the town and how. Um, the large sewer expense is really hampering a lot of our other projects. So we were talking with them. We recently had the select board, well, they can report on that. They had a meeting um, last Friday with DOT to talk about, um, I, I think DOT wants us to take over uh, Sugarloaf Street and, and uh, Park Street, but we're concerned that we don't know what's happening in the infrastructure underneath the roads. 
So that at least was the beginning of a conversation and they'll continue that conversation. So I think that was very helpful. And then we did, um, and thank you, Andrea, once again, um, I think, as I said, persistence proves profitable. So um, Andrea had, I mean, a number of us, I, I think Jennifer or Casey had gotten in touch with uh, Jim McGovern to come out here and Andrea also did because Andrea does a lot, a lot of work with the food bank. So at any rate, we did get Jim McGovern out here on Friday and it was terrific. It was a great meeting. He was extremely receptive and he's, he was um, very impressed with all the work that everyone is doing on CCI and Connecting Community Initiative. So we did, uh, we did a tour through the former senior center, elementary school, and then also the church. And so I think he is going to get in touch with some people from USDA to, to see if we can work with them you know, on funding issues. And then he also said he'd like to get together every couple of months to continue the conversation and possibly with Joe and Natalie. So I think it was really helpful. And again, um, you know, I give credit to the whole group, the whole Collect Connecting Community Initiative, because we have a lot of really committed individuals on there and uh, people are really paying attention. So we're just trying to move forward and it's, it's just been really great. So thanks to everyone. That's it. All right. Any other committee reports? Okay. Um, well, so we did have some other mail, primarily Greenfield, that's been busy. Um, uh, there's EBA, which is interesting, granted two variants, variances in the site plan approval to reduce an eight foot landscape buffer to zero and reduce the required open space from 15% to 7%. I think there's a story there, <laughs> that is. Um, the ZBA also granted a special permit for a six foot stockade fence within a front setback. And the ZBA granted a special permit to allow continued use of property on Deerfield Street as a single family home. It is located in a commercial district. And then on July 12th, tomorrow, um, they're having a joint public hearing of the planning board and the economic development committee um, to consider a one year moratorium on outdoor marijuana cultivation facilities and limit the size of such facilities. Probably been reading about that some in the newspaper. Um, so that was Greenfield. Maybe everybody else is taking a little summer off, Rachel, not just August. <laughs> right. I, I had a very interesting I was at the Cape this past weekend and there was, there was big holes in the ground near our place. And, um, it is, uh, townhouses, affordable housing townhouses funded in part by workforce grants. And so I, I did a lot of digging and they've been on this for since 2016, obviously slowed down by the, but something, if anybody's interested at McGansett crossing, it's in Falmouth. And I just thought about it because it's actually two and two and three bedroom townhouses, and I, I'm I've got the guy's name. I've been like doing all the internet search, got the mm -hmm. guy's name because it's it's the quintessential private public. It's a, it was a forty B friendly forty B development, mm -hmm. and um, they went from twelve to ten units. There was concern about the density because they they went in a space that was anyway super interesting, and they're broke ground and. Uh, I'll be following it, it with more than just a little casual, you know, casual interest because it does look like something. Um, you need to meet these developers who are interested in this kind of project. <laughs> I thought when you said holes in the ground that literally, oh my gosh, there's these sinkholes and things are falling. No, they're just great big <laughs> foundational holes. But it, 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 you know, things don't change down there that much where we are, so it's pretty dramatic. All right. That's good. All right. Workforce right. housing. That's the thing. I guess they got a workforce grant, um, a state grant. Yeah. yeah. Okay, as totally. well as local grant. All right. So um, our next meeting is September 12th, unless we hear otherwise. Correct. And um, may I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, I, I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Well, very good. Man. You were quick with that. And, and uh, well, you were just about to open the door for somebody else. I could see that. <laughs> but Andrea, we'll second that motion. Okay, Kathy. Right. Um, any discussion? <laughs> All right, Denise. Yes. 
Yes, uh, Rachel? Yep. And Mary? Yes. <laughs> Kathy? Absolutely. Uh, Kathy Latroba? <laughs> yes. Andrew Leibson? Yes. And then Lee and Ken, thank you very much for attending tonight. Really thank nice to have you. Ken, as always, thank you so much. Uh, see okay. you in September. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. Bye.